I loved realizing that my fantasy world could be a reality. Because I always, I read a lot as a kid. I was always like a reader. I mean, I was one of the kids that would stay up until like 5 a.m. because I had to finish a book and then have to get up for school and be exhausted. Podcast Junkies, episode 206. Welcome back. If you are new to the show, my name is Harry Duran, host of said show, where I interview amazing luminaries and notable folks in the podcasting space. And this week, another great conversation with Stephanie Lahart. But last week, we had a return to Podcast Junkies from none other than Mr. Patrick Keller, aka superfan of the show. So please check that out. It was a nice visit after almost three years of his initial visit on the show, episode 205. Patrick never disappoints, and he even created his own retention hashtag. So how cool is that? So in this episode, I speak to Stephanie Lahart. She's the host of Tradigital Talk Show. It's a merge of traditional and digital. Stephanie and I got reconnected at PodFest, and you'll hear the whole origin story in the beginning of the episode. But what's interesting is that she's really a tech aficionado at heart, and we share a lot of the same old stories about what it was like being in those early days of not only the internet, but also podcasting and gaming We reminisce on a couple of her favorite books from her childhood and how her working as a reporter in the music industry helped get her introduced into the tech world. Stephanie really knows her stuff when it comes to all things digital marketing and especially this new wave of social engineering scams. And it was really an eye-opening conversation about all the different ways these nefarious companies are trying to steal our information. We even have a little fun talking about the idea of a pet as an influencer on social media. So fun, wide ranging conversation with someone who's been in tech for a long time and is a fan. And it was nice to reminisce as well. This episode is brought to you by the podcast Quick Start Workshop. This is something brand new I've never done before. It's a live online paid workshop, and it's going to be on November 4th. It's the first time I actually outline all the steps that we take when we launch shows for our clients at Fullcast. And I've been asked a couple of times for help with folks with new shows, and I've been doing a lot of one-on-one consulting And at Fullcast, it's something that we do as a done-for-you service. It's a premium price service, so it's obviously not available to everyone. So I've been thinking about a way to help a wider range of folks and been putting this together for the past couple of weeks. So I'm really excited. If you have been thinking about launching your show and you've been putting it off because you're a bit overwhelmed with all the tech questions or you know someone who could benefit from having their own show finally launched, now is the time to do it. It's going to be a fun 90-minute training followed by a 30-minute Q&A. Again, it's the first time that I've ever done something like this. So head on over to podcastjunkies.com forward slash quick start to sign up. Once again, we are brought to you by the Scarlet 2i2 sound card by the wonderful folks at Focusrite. Shout out to Dan Hewley. Can't say enough good things about this sound card. Super clean preamps, which provide a clean boost to your sound. So I've used it both with the Samson Q2U microphone, as well as the Shure SM7B, which is a bit gain hungry and definitely requires a clean sound card. So this is the new 3G third generation sound card, and it's guaranteed to make your audio sound completely professional. Make sure you stay to the end of the episode where I reveal this week's retention hashtag. But let's get into some reminiscing with Stephanie. So Stephanie Lahart, host of the Traditional Podcast, thank you for joining us on Podcast Junkies. Thank you so much, Harry. I'm really happy to be here. As is always the case when these get started and we're in the green room, we start having a conversation and I realize, wait, we should talk about this on the show. (laughs) Yeah. So I think it's just more natural if we just get started. And it's funny because for the benefit of the listener, you were asking what we what we're going to talk about. And I said, well, I don't know, we're going to figure it out <laughs> as soon as we start recording. So one of the easiest ways to um, segue is something I've been doing recently is just what I call the origin story. So mm. if you for the benefit of the listener, if you could just uh, to the best of your recollection, uh, talk about the story about when we first met. 
Oh, when we first met. Okay. When, it's funny because when you said origin story, in my mind, I immediately thought, which origin do you want? How I was bored, how I got here, why I moved to LA, why I'm a pilot. I mean, there's so many origins. We could be here them. for an hour. But yeah. so you've narrowed it down to when we first met. Okay. Can I make a confession? Yeah. I know we met at PodFest Multimedia Expo, but the initial meeting, I don't recollect because remember, I'm doing social media work for mm -hmm. them when I'm there. Mm -hmm. So I'm being like introduced and kind of like sensory overload with work and everybody coming at me. Oh, yeah. But I know we met because I remember our second meeting vividly because that was over in Silver Lake because we both showed up at a Silver Lake, I think it was Chamber of Commerce meeting. Yeah. Was it the Chamber of Commerce or were they just a networking group? It was Silver Lake um, small business group. It was like some small business, like local merchants meetup. And, yeah. And that was our first actual meetup, I think, if I'm not mistaken. I think we really? first... Really? And then yeah. did we meet at PodFest <laughs> yeah, after? Pod, yeah, PodFest after. Oh, good that I remember our first <laughs> meeting. Okay, so let me tell you about that night. So at that point in my, my work, I was really into, I've got to get out to local networking meetings. And several people had said to me, you should join a chamber of commerce, which honestly, I had never done before. So I was looking around my area and like, okay, saw the Silver Lake one and popped up on like, I think, Meetup. And I'm like, I'm going to go over there because it, and number one, it's easy to get to. And number two, I heard that the food at the place was really good. <laughs> And I knew that they had vegan options. So I was like, I just want to go to this just so I can eat. Uh, you know, I mean, it's like, you know how it is. At least go for the food. Exactly. So I'm like, this sounds like something I'd be into. So I put on my, my work clothes, some makeup, some heels, drove over there. And I have to say, it was a great meetup. I met really cool, interesting people. Um, and I ha think it was like one of the strongest networking meetings I was ever at, where the people that were there seemed to really be invested in the group and not only that be invested in building silver lake business which i thought was fascinating and so meeting to my you know coming to my point of how i met you so i'm working the crowd with my cards wandering around and i see you across the room and i'm like oh he's really cute i'm gonna go talk to him <laughs> because i always go for the cute people first and then i went over and we started talking and you're like oh i i do this podcast uh a company, this business. And at that point, I had already started working with PodFest Multimedia Expo. So we had something to talk about. And uh, I think that's how we first started talking. And I don't think we talked real long that night. And because they did like that whole round robin thing, where everybody goes yeah. in a circle and talks about themselves, which I always find a little awkward and not really productive, because people are standing there just worrying about what they're going to say. And nobody's listening to the person that's actually talking. I mean, do you kind of agree with that when they do those round robin groups like that? Yeah, sometimes they're good because they get you out of your comfort zone because you can go to a lot of these meetups and I'm sure folks, uh, you know, those listening can relate as well that you, you go there because with the intention of like meeting, meet and greet and, you know, all these things on meetup.com, networking events and, and everyone needs a couple of like, drinks to get like the social lubricant and <laughs> relaxed but sometimes you go and then you just fly on the wall and you just spend the whole two hours like walking around the room and you don't talk to anyone because it's hard because everyone's got their clicks and people have probably been going for a while so you know in, in a way it's nice and and for me i just want to talk about podcasting and and so if i hadn't done that then i would have had to have mm -hmm probably said hi or said something to every single person there. Um, so I think sometimes um, I, I tend to lean on the side of it, it being better just to get people out of their comfort zone because it's just a common thing. And, and that was a small group. It's probably like 20, maybe 30 people there. And so I think it was, it was a good opportunity. I was living across the street at the time. So it was really, con oh. it was really convenient for me. So I just actually walked over. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I agree with things that you said. However, since you know me in person, and you know I don't have a problem talking to anybody about anything at any time. So I do, I empathize with people that do have that issue and everything. Yeah, I, I don't know. Sometimes I just find like you just don't really get to talk to people because those things can run a little bit long. But you're right. Then at least we heard like who was what. And I, that's probably when I heard that you were a podcaster. I mean, I don't know how we originally started talking. But can I also tell you? That night, the fri French fries there. Oh my God! Did you eat the burger. French fries? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh. It's called. Um, it's a burger. It's funny because you said you're vegan, and it's actually a burger place that we were at. But they have vegetarian, vegan burgers yeah, there because we're in LA. Yeah. So everything's gluten free. <laughs> I mean, vegan. Uh, everything's you know a slash dot whatever you want to call it. 
everybody's a the, the joke here is everybody's a, a slash which means i'm a model slash actress slash p- producer slash director and everybody is gluten-free vegan vegetarian keto paleo so yeah all sorts of hybrids of like uh I'm all act- hybrids i'm actually pescatarian now so that's and you're a pescatarian <laughs> i just went on a date with a pescatarian <laughs> how'd that go the, uh, listen, I have to tell you, the date was awesome. I really like the guy. He seemed to really like me. However, he is married to his job. So planning mm-hmm. date number two, uh, I don't think it's ever going to happen because our first date was like three weeks ago. And it's just not like every now and then like we'll text me like, yeah, we should go out and we'll plan something. And then that doesn't happen. And I'm like, I'm going to be like 90 before I get to date number two with this guy. So this apparently is not happening. But he was very cute. He was a video game animator, which fills up my geeky techie side. Because I just love people that are super technical and like super into what they do. So I'm I'm curious which you were into first, social media, veganism, or gaming? (laughs) Okay, so I was a vegetarian first. Because I became a vegetarian when I was 17 because I joined PETA. I, a friend of mine in, in high school had introduced me to vegetarianism and this group called PETA. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is like what I believe. Like, I would never had a word for it before, just the way I felt. And then I was like, wow, this is what I want to do. And my parents were very accepting. So I became a vegetarian. And so that was like 17. So I would like to say vegetarianism came first, but switching to vegan, which is no animal products at all, that yeah. came later in life. And then the gaming somewhere... Gaming, actually, I got into around the mid-90s when everybody, like, video games just became the hot thing and comic books and everything, mm-hmm. I think especially in L.A. And I actually started dating a video game animator back then, too. So that's a clearly... I'm noticing a trend. That's my trend. And, uh, yeah. What, wait, what was the third thing? Veganism? Social gaming? media. Oh, social media. Yeah, so that came last then because, okay, so when I back when I first moved to L.A., I got involved in the early internet as you and i had a conversation recently about this where we got into website development and designing when it was first a thing you know where i always tell people that the website came into consciousness for me around 1995 Mm, where suddenly i was introduced to it yeah and i was like what is well at the point i was working at an ad agency okay and they actually were in the gaming business because what they did is they sold advertising space in gaming magazines. So they were handling the biggest ones at the time, which were EGM, which is Electronic Gaming Monthly, Computer Gaming, uh, Computer World, and uh, a bunch of the other, whatever the big gaming companies, you know, magazines were around that time. And they were owned by an independent publisher uh, before they became part of Ziff Davis many years later. So now I, I believe they're they might still be owned by Ziff Davis. But anyway, so I was introduced to the internet through them because all of a sudden people are like, whoa, there's this thing called the internet and we're going to be servicing the advertising on it. And I was like, what is this? And I remember the very first website that was ever shown was like, you know, it was just text. It was like a couple of colors, you know, maybe one like janky, like little animated graphic, if that. And I was like, whoa, this is the coolest thing I have ever seen. And at that point, I like all the early adapters, just went home, taught myself HTML, taught myself how to build a website, how to, how to do graphics. And I was in. I mean, I was in. What was the, uh, I guess your, your cred comes, your street cred comes from saying which browser you were using at the time, right? Oh, my God. I don't even. What were we using Mo- back then? Mosaic. Was it Netscape? Wasn't Netscape. It was Netscape. I was using it Netscape. And I remember I was playing around with Opera for a while. Like, there was the, that was the cool browser. And, uh, oh, no, no, yeah. no. Yeah. No, no, it was no, it was an opera. I was thinking about um, didn't IBM come out with an operating system that was like trying to be like the new DOS or the new Windows or something like that. I remember installing it. Yeah, I was like totally like trying all these new tools and stuff like that. But I remember, yeah, the early days was like Mosaic and Netscape, and then learning HTML. Um, right. And, it was, and I was using uh, Dreamweaver <laughs> to build yes. websites. So yeah. But at that time, like. Where did you go to learn this stuff? Because it wasn't like it wasn't like all these tools and all these websites where you can learn this stuff now. So do you remember like where where you learned it from? 
where I first started learning it was online because people at that point, there wasn't a lot of people online. And the people that were online, a lot of them had come from the BBS community. Okay, so you were dealing with, first of all, people who were already into computer programming or um, um, some of them even hackers. You know, the phone freakers were big back then. Oh, yeah. uh, so everybody was part of these BBS boards and they were incredibly helpful. So if you saw something online and there was like some kind of chat room and you said to somebody, how do you do that? People would take the time to explain it to you in detail. This is how you build. I mean, and that's literally how I started learning because there weren't books at that point. You know, they came out like pretty quickly, maybe within the next two years. But at that point, I was doing a lot of online tutorials one-on-one -on -one with people who already knew what HTML was and how these things worked. And I was like, this is incredible. In fact, I remember back when messengers first started coming out. Do you remember like one of the original was called ICQ? ICQ, yeah, yeah of course. Mm -hmm. Okay. When you first wanted to get that running on your computer, it was such a long drawn out painful process process like i really sometimes even with like how easy it is for us to do like live video now i am so like if you kids could have seen what we went through back then but i remember going through about three days with this guy online where he we are trying to get icq running on my machine and all of this and i remember when it finally got running and i could have these like chats i was like this is incredible and then all of a sudden AOL became this big thing, which by the way, I was never part of the AOL bandwagon, but that's why the internet took off was because suddenly people could have these conversations with people that they never met. And it was just explosive. It was, you know, wow, I can meet somebody across the world. And admittedly, I will tell you why I was super interested because I got involved, wait for this, in the vampire and gothic chat rooms. Okay, that's something else. This was when Anne Rice and oh, Interview yeah. with the Vampire was blowing oh, that's right. up. That's right. Yes. Yeah, and it's Bra and, Brad Pitt and, and Tom Cruise, right? <laughs> well, it was, it was even right. It was before the movie, but everybody had oh, read right, the books because yeah. I read the books in high school. Okay. But, you know, when the internet first started in that forum, it was still about special interest. So, and there were a lot of like these weirdo gaming, geeky, you know, gaming people. So people who were in the like, you know, fantasy worlds like Dungeons and Dragons and like any of the new, you know, early games that were out there, the role-playing games, they were huge. And that's how you met people. And I had like this interest in vampires because I'd read the, you know, read the Anne Rice books and, you know, it was all like, oh my God, how romantic. You know, we all like, I don't know what it to be dead at that. Well, it's like vampires, how romantic. We all wanted to be, it was very, right? So that's how I really met a lot of people was through these chat rooms. And then LA started having a huge gothic explosion where all of these gothic clubs started opening up. And it all started happening around the same time. So suddenly, mm -hmm. I found this new toy called the internet. And people that I met online, it wasn't like one of those circumstances, like I was mentioning before, an AOL chat room where you met people, but you never met them in real life. Suddenly, I had people that I met online. And they're like, oh, no, I live in the area. And we're all going to this club. And I was like, I'm in. And then I met all these wow. really cool, creative people. And it was so exciting. Well, wow, there's a lot of a lot of questions there. <laughs> when do you did you ever play any of those early like text based games like Zork or? Um, oh yeah, and, yeah. Those were all so much fun. Yeah, I actually I had a I had a Commodore sixty four when I was in okay. grade school, so I did all of the. In fact, my uncle is a Ahean computer guy. Uh, worked in like the. Uh, what what do you call it? aerospace industry and he gave us a computer uh, my sisters and i when we were in grade school and i remember it having it the cassette player that we, you would have to play oh, yeah. as the game was going along oh yeah. oh yeah and i i was fascinated we had like this dragon one. Oh my god well i was always a very creative kid i mean i was like the what they called the artsy kid of the family so i was always drawing and writing and things like that and so to be have this interactive story like that it was mind-boggling at the time and then you know video games became a huge thing and we got atari and things i mean it was just it was such a magical time because there was nothing ever like that before it's so different now like kids yeah. are overwhelmed and inundated with stuff and they don't have that moment of discovery of a new world i feel like where like the fantasy you're like oh that's a reality like i can i can do that they seem it to was cool i think they take it for granted and and, and obviously it's it's almost like Every generation says this, like, I feel like every generation says, oh, you kids don't understand, or you guys, oh, you kids never 
her, can't understand what Elvis is or, you know, like, oh, you kids <laughs> didn't understand what like swing music was. I don't know. Just like every generation is going to be like their generation was like awesome. Like I think the 80s are awesome, you know, not to I mean, 90s were OK. But for me, like I grew up, I'm a child of the 80s. But I think there's certain things that you can say that you were there for, like like the birth of the Internet, like um the, like for me, like because I love music and electronic music and DJing, like the birth of hip hop, like the birth of like house music. Like I was literally like buying vinyl and just being like, whoa, this is amazing. Like all this cool thing happening. And I think there was a bit of wonder there. I, we plugged in our first Atari 2600 to a black and white TV and we we're just like, yeah, <laughs> Pac, Pac Man. Um, but there's some sense of like, um, I had Texas Instruments, Tandy 1000, so like early computers. I was playing like Leisure Suit Larry and yeah. uh, Carmen Miranda and all these like cool, like fun games. But now they're just so immersive CGI. Like some of them are just like so realistic. It's just crazy. And um, the millions and millions of dollars that is the gaming industry is just bananas. And then you've got like esports and millionaire kids playing video games and being yes. paid and our celebrities and there's just like it's bananas but i i mean i guess that's what um progress does and, and that's what innovation mm -hmm. does that whole combination but you know that's it's been interesting to watch especially as someone who's been doing it as early as you have yeah and going back to what you said about we all look at our generation as like oh my god that was the best generation or you know that was better than whatever but you know that is going to continue because we can never see from where we're sitting right now, what the future is going to hold. So we're always building, and I always like liken it to everybody in the, the universe puts their block on the creation. You know, yeah. like your little, we all have a Lego block, and we're all like constantly building on that. So where we're sitting right now, we're like, oh, we can't see. And yeah, in another 10 years, people who are of the millennial or what's the next generation on Generation Z will look back and say, oh, well, this was a magical time because there's something totally new and that, you know, that is totally exciting, you know, but for us, our own individual experience, that's what we have to go on. And I do remember like how, how just, I loved realizing that my fantasy world could be a reality. Cause I always, I read a lot as a kid. I was always like a reader. I mean, I was one of the kids that would stay up until like 5am cause I had to finish a book and then have to get up for school and be exhausted. But I was like, I I couldn't like put books down. What's and, some know, of your earliest? Me what's 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 an early favorite or something? One of those that just that you read, you remember reading, and it's just kind of brings you like a little bit of nostalgia when you think about, it, or something that had an impact early on. One of your earlier books. Well, the books that you know what? Honestly, I remember in grade school reading the Peter Rabbit books. Oh yeah. And I loved oh, yeah. them. There was a whole series, but I was always in the library and I was always like, you know, reading books. And then, you know, as I, you know, grew up and, and developed, and then of course, you know, because I am a girl and we all had to read the, uh, the, uh, are you there? God, it's me, Margaret. And what was her name? I can't think of the author. Judy Beverly, Bloom. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was uh, Beverly, Judy Bloom. Judy Bloom. And it was Beverly Cleary. Cleary was another one, wasn't she? Yes. So we all got into those kind I of books, those. but I just, yeah. it was just so great to be able to read those worlds. But really when my life changed and I'm not embarrassed to say it is I started reading those historical romance novels <laughs> and I was like oh my god I'm going to write historical romances like this was my dream for years and this is when we still called them bodice rippers okay because oh, yeah. it was always yeah we called them the bodice rippers because the girls were always getting their clothes off like no please don't but I love you so much of course now that we're in this day and age I mean it's like a, you don't even mention that it's like oh no these are the ones with, uh, with um, yes, Fabio on Fabio, the cover yeah. Fabio. Yeah. well Fabio looking good guys. Yeah, that's what I was super into. Um, and it was funny because looking back at those books now, I can see why people nowadays would have problems with it. But when you were reading those books, let me tell you, the input and the feelings and kind of the, the message you were getting was not a woman as being helpless and as being taken advantage of, because the stories were focused around this burning love that this couple always had. And they were always love stories. So you would never get away now, I don't think, with being able to publish. The, uh, there was a book, actually, which I still remember vividly. It's called The Wolf and the Dove. It was my favorite mm. book. I think I still have a copy. If you read it today, it would probably be bad because there was a lot of ripping of clothes non-consensually. <laughs> but back then when I read it in high school, I did not input it as I was weak. I was going to be taken advantage of. The story I focused on was this incredible burning love story of the two main characters. And, and that you were just like, 
oh my God, like I want someone to look and desire and, and have a relationship like that, like that burning, like love, like I'm still looking for it by the way, but <laughs> uh, anyway, so now I have to, I have to tell you, I just discovered the Outlander series. Oh yeah. Someone keeps, I've, I've heard it mentioned a couple of times. <laughs> I did not know it exists. I heard it's popular Netflix, with the ladies. Netflix suggested it to me. I watched the first season. It is a romance novel. There is no bodice ripping, but it is a romance novel in the burning passion kind of way. But she is an amazing writer, and it was so good. I started reading the books as well as watching the series on Netflix. And I was like, all of a sudden, my my passion for romance novel writing was rekindled. I'm like, why did I do this? Like, this is like totally Radical, what I want yeah. to do. It was really funny. So in another year, you might be interviewing me saying, so tell me about that book that you're publishing. <laughs> or tell me about the Outlander podcast that you started. I, oh, I, I Listen, I'm trying not to get sucked in that hole. I don't do the fangirl thing anyway, yeah. but I did like, of course, start looking it up online and yeah, people have podcasts and they have Twitters and they have all kinds. And I'm like, I'm not going down that route. And obsessing about the people that played the character in the like series because oh, they're crazy. not the people. And, like I don't fall into that. I mean, the guy's cute and everything, but I'm not going to be like you know having his name tattooed on my arm. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the fanboy. Some fan people do thing. that. They get like really like deep. Yeah, and they're, they they dress up in costumes. You get into all the cosplay now stuff and like yeah. Comic Con and I'm sure all those things. But like yeah, the, yeah, the whole fanboy fangirl thing. There's no show that does not come out now that doesn't have a podcast like literally like it, it yeah. has at least every show i think has at least one if not like half a dozen depending how popular it is but it's crazy because it's almost like your foray you like you want to be the first one you're looking for that like weird <laughs> niche show and you're like i'm going to start a podcast and then what's the beauty about that though is the more niche the better because you're going to have the 50 people that listen to it that are literally like super passionate about it and they're just going to keep listening listening to your show so i think it's interesting and you know what else is interesting is the fact that since all of these shows are being rebooted, that people are now doing podcasts and, and commentaries on the old, whatever the old series was, oh, like yeah. say the original Buffy. Um, so it's all just about that. And then people are doing, of course, all and everything about the new one that's just about to be released. And now they're doing shows about how the new one matches up to the old one. So now there's this whole intersecting of universes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and this, uh, it's so funny because you mentioned that. I'm wondering now, I'm just curious, is there a Gilligan's Island podcast now? <laughs> there's got to be. It's crazy. Okay, I'll, yeah. I'll, one day I was running with – so I, I, I run with a group. We're running one day, and I see a dog on a picnic bench, okay, and another dog on the table. And I start laughing, and I'm like, that is the cutest thing ever. I want to take a picture. And then I said, I bet there's an Instagram called Dogs on Tables. <laughs> and sure enough. And it has like a million followers, and it's all really? pictures, people submitting pictures of dogs sitting on tables. I swear to God, it's a thing. So yes, there is a podcast for everything. The thing with pets is also interesting. Like, there's people who actively maintain Instagram accounts for their pets, and so uh... like, yeah. And I had a friend who was kind of getting into it. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, he was posting. Pose, and he was a good photographer too. So he was putting filters on it, and like every day, like a new photo, like greetings or or Buffy or Scruffy says hi, and like and but the thing is, it's a whole subgenre of like people that do that, and they follow each other. And some of these accounts have like a million followers, and some of these dogs are personalities. It's kind of weird. I wish you had video right now so you could see my face because um, I'm one of those people, Harry. I adopted, I, I fell into the dog hole, I, following all these people with their dog Instagrams. I adopted a rescue dog last month, and he does have an Instagram, and we post every day. His name is Charlie Chief Rocca, and I think you should all follow him. I'm well, not now they're it's, it's, no, Now they're going to, because so now you're going to listen to this, and so now he's, he's going to get a whole bunch of new followers. But <laughs> let me tell you, though, these dog Instagrams are such a place of pure positivity. It can't help but, like, brighten That's your true. day. Yeah, yeah, of course. It really, like, because my, my senior dog passed away at the beginning of the year, and I was so sad, and that's how I fell into the Instagram dog hole. And it made me feel better to see these people with their dogs like and i'm like oh my god they're so cute and yes they all have personalities they dress they dress their dogs up in little outfits and everything which you will not see my dog charlie in because he has already let me know that he is not a doll i tried to put something on him he immediately tried to eat it off i'm like oh, he oh does that's not funny. Like that. what kind of dog is it he's a pit bull oh pit bull you got him as a puppy 
No, I, I just adopted him from Angel City Pitbull Rescue. He's two. That's good. Yeah, I think pit bulls always make people a little nervous because of just all the ways that the older ones or the older generations of pit bulls were like trained. And a lot of these rescues, obviously, they came from probably bad environments. So I think when people see them, they initially are a little apprehensive. I don't know if you found that to be the case when, when they meet Charlie. Oh, it definitely. Um, it's funny, though, because in LA, there's actually a lot of pit bulls. In fact, our shelters are filled with them. Mm. Unfortunately, you know, they still have that reputation because people they don't always adopt them or breed them for nefarious purposes, but you have to understand it is a big dog and it is a very strong dog. But that the same could be said about Rottweilers or German Shepherds or any of those. Yeah, yeah. The thing is, though, you only hear about pit bulls on the news. So people are always have that misconception of like, they're aggressive dogs, they're mean, and they, they still come from a line of dog breeding. And that's simply not true. Just because you have a pit bull does not mean it's going to inherently be aggressive or, or because like people are always like, well, you have to understand this dog was bred to fight. It's like, no, that's not true anymore. This dog was this particular dog was not bred to fight. It's not like a gene thing all the time, but it, it is a strong dog. I mean, he's 75 pounds. You have to be smart wow. and you have to be responsible when you adopt a, a larger dog, which I mean, I immediately hired a trainer, which he's at three times a week, not only training my dog, but training me too. But mm. I've had pit bulls before too. Okay. And you know, that's really when it comes down to people fall down in their responsibility to the animal that they've adopted, but they can do that with a smaller breed too. Cause I find, you know, it's usually the, the tiny dogs, people don't bother to train at all. And they're the ones that are barking and kind of jumping and biting at everyone. But with any animal that you adopt, whatever it is, you have to spend time making sure your dog is socialized and, you know, trained in a way that is not only safe for you, but safe for the dog as well. So yeah, I, I mean, I sometimes, you know, see people that are like, oh my God, they're a little nervous, but you know, listen, the dog is the least of your problems at LA. You're more likely to get run down by a car around here because let me tell you, the drivers in LA are not looking out for you at all. You said you moved there. Where'd you move from? I am from the East Coast. I'm from Philadelphia originally. And how old are you when you moved? I moved right out of college. So I was a baby at 22. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, in fact, when I look back at pictures, I always joke with my mom. I'm like, you should be put in jail for letting your baby move to L.A. I'm like, look at this girl. And I like hold up the picture. I'm like, look at her. She was a child. What were you thinking? It is true. I look back at old pictures of myself and I'm like, oh, my God, I was like so young. <laughs> but I thought I knew everything, of course. <laughs> Whose decision was that to move? Oh, mine. I, I was... I was just in love from LA, like since the time I was a, in grade school, because we had family out here as well. So I had been out okay. to LA before. And once I got out here and saw the weather and just like, I don't know, there was something just very attractive about this place to me. Yeah. The palm, there's always something about the palm trees. I've, I always remembered even before I, I lived there for a while, like when you would land at the airport and then you'd see palm trees as soon as you walk out of the airport, you're like, you don't see you, in Miami maybe, but that's about it. And it's just like, it just, changes your whole mood i think especially after getting off a long flight true well we all have the uh the fairy tales in our head too about hollywood and yeah, la so you kind of get off the plane with like this the stardust in your eyes of like oh this is but it is true though because a lot of people move here and think this is where dreams happen and that's why there is so much innovation that happens out here because people come here knowing that they can do anything you can make a business out of anything you can be anybody you want you can come and reinvent yourself I mean, I like to think I did. <laughs> That's a great segue then. What did you, what was your intention when you got to LA? Like, what were you, what were you thinking you were going to be doing? Well, I wanted to be a writer in some capacity. I didn't really know what that was going to be. But more importantly, I wanted to be in the music business. I wanted to be an A&R developing talent. Mm. That's what I came out here to do. I was like, oh, I'm going to go. And at that point, it was, you know, rock and roll was king. Yeah. Like, you know, the hair band kind of thing. It was the early 90s. So, you know, you MTV was just like, oh, you know, yeah. really showing us that life. And I was very into the rock and roll scene. So I'm like, I'm going to move to LA. I'm going to be in the music business. I'm going to be developing talent. I'm going to be like part of history. It's going to be amazing. And then I move out here, did a couple internships, <laughs> started figuring out that, you know what? I don't love music enough to put up with the bullshit that you have to put up with. Oh, yeah. In the beginning stages I'm sure. at that time. And that's when there were still record companies around that were very powerful and stuff. 
And I just remember being like, eh, I don't know if this is what I want to do. And shortly thereafter, I was very, very lucky when I moved to LA. I, I tell everybody, I'm like, I didn't struggle at all. I really didn't. I have family in Santa Monica. I moved out here. I mean, I didn't live with them, but I had a very supportive family back home. So I was, I just had people like in my corner and I got lucky. I mean, I had a really good job within a couple of months where I was working for this ad agency. Yeah. So, and I mean, I was right out of college and actually being at the ad agency, they hooked me up with a rock and roll magazine that I started writing for, for like a year. Do you remember Circus Magazine? I do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was mostly, it's mostly rock and roll, right? It was all rock and roll. It was roll. all rock and roll, yeah. I, I think it started in the 60s. It was real big in the 70s and 80s. It started dying out maybe towards the early 2000s. It's defunct now. It's gone. But I got the opportunity to write for them. So at that point, I had a really good job. And now I've got this side writing gig. And I was getting paid really well. I was getting paid like $100 an article, which was insane. Yeah, yeah. If you talk to anybody now who's getting paid to write, they're like, you got 100 bucks an article? I'm like, <laughs> yeah. And not only that, it was the music business. So everybody wanted me to interview their barons and I had like my own um, my own section of the magazine which was called Hard Acts to Follow okay. and so I got to go and interview all these new up and coming bands and like at that point record companies had money so I was getting wined and dined and I was like in my early 20s I was like I made it so funny this is great I mean I even got sent on trips I got sent to New Orleans and everything oh, it was cool, cool. Any, any band stand out from those days that you kind of like either found early or that you remember them when they were just getting started? Well, the bands that I was involved with was the bands that were kind of in the making the rock of the 90s there. So do you remember like Sugar Ray? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got to interview them. Um, I got to interview a lot of people along those lines. I, I interviewed Gene Loves Jezebel. I interviewed, um, God, the names are escaping me right now. But then I got to do bands that you would have already heard of like i interviewed the cure believe it or not wow that's fun yeah i interviewed oh do you remember um blind melon yeah yeah yeah. i got to interview them so i did some really big bands too but you know i i've always been very chatty and comfortable talking to people so it was easy for me to do interviews with bands because i was interested in the music and mm -hmm. i was good at researching and i would walk in and like have all this background information and be able to have a really good conversation i remember actually there was um What's the name of the – I can't remember the name of the record company. They were one of the more independent ones, but they used to have these um, interview uh, reporter dinners and lunches over at a place in Westwood called Monty's, which was a really nice restaurant. It's on the top of one of the high-rises over there. And so I would be invited to eat these all the time. And one day I was running really late for some – one of my day job things was happening. And I show up and I remember the PR there rushes up to me. She's like, oh, my God, Stephanie, thank God you're here because the other – the reporters that we have here are horrific. And she's like, I couldn't wait for you to go here and can't, you know, show up because I knew when you got here, we would all start having fun. And I was like, wow, that's really nice. And like, yeah, I blow in. And then all of a sudden, like the conversation's just easier because I'm just, I'm very good at talking to people yeah. and getting them to talk. So at that point, but I was like, yeah, this, this is really cool. Um, and you know what? Honestly, I probably would have pursued that more if I hadn't fallen into the internet hole. So that's so let's let's look at the timeline here. So you were doing the music stuff there, and then this was '90s, and then obviously we, as we touched upon earlier, you're you always had that inner tech geek side of you that that loved all things technology. So I, I imagine when when that wave of internet hit, that sort of grabbed your attention. For sure, yeah. So I was working at the ad agency. I immediately got involved with, oh, I want to design websites, yep. which I started doing a little work within our agency for them because at that point, nobody oh, yeah. knew anything. That's right. So if you were one of the people that knew something, they're like, ask Stephanie. She knows how to do that. And I moved into my first internet startup. I got hired for my first internet startup in 1996 mm. or 95 or 96. And that, that just started me on my rabbit hole of just like, and I started designing websites. So I did that for a very long time. And, and then at that point, um, you know, more training kind of came out. I never went to school with it because there wasn't school for it, yeah. but books came out and you learn stuff pretty mm -hmm. easily online because people were always writing online tutorials of stuff. So that's how all of the, you know, original websites were built. And I did that for many years. And then I ended up hooking up with, um, somebody else and we formed our own company and really got high end into developing WordPress and Drupal websites. Mm. So we did that for many years. So when do you, when's the first recollection of podcasting? Podcasting I heard about for a long time before I ever got involved with it. 
because it was just one of the well I had I had started working for myself a long time ago. So, I mean, I started working for myself I think back in 2001. And podcasting I started hearing about maybe maybe like 2006. Do you think that's too early? No, that sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the first podcasters that people seem to really hear about was of course like Joe Rogan. I think he was like the, He was early. Call- yeah, but I th- there was um I mean people talk about um who's the guy from MTV, Adam Adam Curry? Adam Curry, he's considered basically the the godfather of podcasting. Oh, okay. Cuz he basically came up with the format or he was one of the first podcasts and I you know there's arguments back and forth. Now he didn't come up with the phrase. This I think there was some guy in England that came up with the phrase podcast cuz at, at the time you used to have to sync up your phone so you have to plug it in so you could sync up the the, the iTunes to your yeah. digital device, your iRiver or whatever it is that you, it was like. It would have like four MP3s on it, and it would be like a, a, an amazing thing. Um, but yeah, Adam Curry is the, considered one of the the. And then Leo Laporte had a podcast early on. Oh yeah, at, Twit Network. Well. I've watched yeah. for years. Love him. And then uh, and Joe Rogan at the time was doing just YouTube channels, I think. Um, th- but this was later on, and I mean, it's so funny because there's a there's something online where one of his friends, Brian McCown, who's another comic, says, dude, you don't know what you're doing. Like, this is so stupid. You're not even editing the shows. They're three hours long. Like, no one's going to listen to this. Like, what? Do you, you have no idea what you're – like, he was basically saying you're an idiot and you don't know how to podcast, <laughs> which is so funny because at the time it just speaks to, like, if you do your passion, um, as with anything else, like, it's, it's going to work out. So I was just curious in terms of the timeline, like, with all – because it seemed like you're an early adopter to a lot of technology, and I'm wondering um, how you heard about it and, and when you decided to make the jump yourself. Yeah, so back then, I mean, I was definitely hearing about it. It wasn't something I was super interested in because a lot of the first podcasts were just either they were technical or they were that these kind of outrageous personalities like Joe Rogan and God bless him and everything, but he's not really my cup of tea. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just never into what you call back then. It's like, I guess, the shock jock kind of vibe. Mm-hmm. I was never into Howard like Stern the Howard vibe, Snow. Yeah. I did, that was really not my my thing. And um, But Leo Lepore, yeah, and the Twit Network, I watched early on. Uh, but he was doing video early on. He wasn't just podcast mm, mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. he came from television. Yeah. So I was watching his early renditions of his show, you know, and all of his shows. God, he must have like 20 shows now, whatever they do. So I was aware of it, but I didn't really start getting involved and me interested in listening to them, honestly, until about two years ago. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, people what you would hear about podcasting is people are like, Oh, I love it. Cause I can listen to my car when I'm doing all these other things yeah. and, you know, being an entrepreneur and working for myself, whether in my home office or another office, I never had like a lot of time, like downtime where I was like, Oh, let me just put on a podcast. Why I'm like driving two hours. Like I never had a commute like that. So honestly I didn't get sucked into that. And it just seemed to somehow like, I just never really found a topic I was very interested in. Whole different story now. Now I'm like the podcast queen. So <laughs> I guess a couple of years ago, I got, I've got i got introduced to the people of PodFest Multimedia Expo because they were looking for social media help. And honestly, that's what really got me into podcasting because suddenly I started getting introduced to all these podcasters and realizing that there were so many different shows. And then I started finding ones that like, you know, I was interested in and I was like, oh, okay, now I get it. Now I see why people are obsessed with it. And then, of course, I had to start my own podcast because, you know, I just got sucked into the world and it seemed like it was fun. And now and I I joked with you the other day when you were on my show because I was like talking about the Bugaloos and um, video killed the radio star. Oh, yeah. And podcast killed the video star. (laughs) Yeah, that seems like that's the case. Well, just it's they're so accessible on the go and that's the nature of like the world i mean even if i'm like out or you know it's for every anyone if you're walking a dog you're making dinner you're in the treadmill like you have an extra 10 minutes 15 minutes you can consume an episode and i consume episodes at 2x and some even at two and a half x because again it's like entertainment or i'm listening to an interview so i think um it's very accessible for me and just the idea of sitting in front of a youtube video is just not something that that for me doesn't fit my schedule and and the irony is when you do have a business as i'm sure you can relate to you actually have less time to listen to podcasts so now i'm even more selective i mean my show 
this show started podcast junkies because i had so many podcasts on my on my phone i was like oh my god so many shows i'm so, like you know in the beginning you're just it's like narnia right you're just like whoa like this whole new world and then uh sadly now like i have to literally pick and choose and be selective not only about shows but about specific guests on shows too because i'm just like well i love the show but this one guest is like ah, i don't know who that is so i'm just gonna skip it so um mm-hmm. So talk about a little bit about the the start of your show and if you had a bunch of other ideas or you knew right away when you when you started looking into doing your own show that this is the topic you wanted to talk about. Right. So because I was involved with Podfest Multimedia Expo handling their social media and going to the events, I remember it was uh, last year actually. So that would be what's 2019 now. So 2018 we're at the expo, which always happens like in February, March, yep. and they do this event called the. Um, God, I can't think of Pecha Kucha. No, no, it wasn't no. Pecha Kucha. <laughs> it was the. It was called Strategic Alliance. So the oh, yeah, Strategic yeah. Alliance event is they have uh, this room full of tables. Let's say there's like 12, 15 tables. There's seven people at each table. You sit at a table and you have a number, and they ask you various questions. Like there's one question that's put out to the whole room, and then you sit there at the table, and everybody goes around their table and answers that question. Okay, so. Because it's PodFest Multimedia Expo, the first question they ask is, oh, what's your podcast? And I'm sitting there, and I wanted to be a part of it because I was capturing social media during it. Yeah. And they're like, what's your podcast? And they get to me at the table, I'm like, I don't have a podcast. And people just give you that glazed over look like, oh, great. Okay, next. Like, you're not interesting to us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. at a podcasting conference. At a podcasting <laughs> So I was like... I really should have a podcast and you were going to laugh. So, cause <laughs> I was like, okay, then next table. I knew that if somebody was going to ask me that question again, I was going to be ready to go. Cause I thought to myself very quickly in between table changes, what kind of podcast would I have that would be interesting? And I'd already talked to a lot of people about podcasting. And one of the recommendations I always got was like, Hey, if you want to start a podcast, do it with a guest, like with a co-host, yeah. because it's easier to have two people totally. to have a conversation. I'm like, great. Who would I want to talk to? And then my best friend, Sharon came into my mind and Sharon is in traditional PR. She works with a lot of business to business. Um, she's been in PR, you know, her whole career. And I'm like, God, wouldn't it be interesting? And we legitimately, have these conversations with each other all the time before the podcast idea came out where she would be talking about something in her business and then she would ask me a question about my business. We would just have really interesting conversations about how is traditional PR interacting with the new media and social media in general. And I was like, that would be a really interesting podcast to have like traditional PR talking to digital marketing. And all of a sudden the name popped into my head and I'm like, oh my God, traditional digital, tradigital. And I was like, oh, now mind you, this entire idea formulated between me changing <laughs> tables. That's how, That's awesome. so it must have been, That's but it must good. have been in my head anyway, because I'm sure just being in the environment, I had thought for a while, hey, what kind of podcast would I do? So it wasn't like I just kind of like pulled it out of nowhere. I think I'd been thinking about it and didn't really have like the words to deform like what I wanted. And at that point, I'm like, I'm going to do a traditional podcast. And so sure enough, go to the next table. They're like, who are you? What's your podcast? And I'm like, I'm Stephanie. My podcast is the traditional podcast. It's the intersection of where traditional PR meet digital marketing. And people are like, oh my God, tell me more. And that's how it all started. That's a great story. And then, story. then I had to go home and say, hey, Sharon, what do you think about doing a podcast? Hey, Sharon, by the way, you're the co-host of this podcast. By the way. I just, yeah. Created. But here's the thing, though. She was already in the podcast. She was already an avid listener. She had gone into podcasting years earlier. So she was like, yeah, let's let's try it. And she was like fully like just in like excited about it from the beginning, too. That's an awesome story. Yeah, you're that's so funny because like your ability to think on the go and you realize you had the opportunity because at that first one, you're just like, oh, okay, I got I to gotta have a better answer the next time I'm asked this question. And I'm not going to be asked this question in the next five minutes. So that just speaks to your ability to kind of like think quickly. So that was nice. Well, the great thing was I got to do my market research from table to table. Because oh, yeah. at each table, I'm building on my story and I could see people's reactions to what I was saying and how I was also, um, you know, re- like revealing it to people, how I was actually explaining it. So by the end of that event, I mean, my podcast was born out of strategic alliance because I had, I mean, I think I went through maybe 20 tables, seven people at a table. I had, what is that, 140 people to bounce yeah, my idea off that's of. That's awesome. I had a focus group of one-on-one. <laughs> 
headlines with 140 people. So by the end, I had a clear vision. I had a tagline. I had an idea of shows to lined up. It was like, I highly recommend <laughs> if you do go to PodFest Multimedia Expo, take part in the Strategic yeah. Alliance because just having that interaction with people can be so valuable in so many ways. And whether you're just starting your podcast or you know you have an idea for a podcast, because you get that feedback immediately. It's so powerful. It's almost all the more reason to maybe not even have your idea that fleshed out because that, that, that whole market research thing of doing it on the go is extremely powerful. So that was pretty cool. And that's, that's the, one of the best advertisements for that for both the event and, and and that specific conference so yeah nothing but great things to say about john and chris and podfest so it's definitely one of my go-tos every single year now yeah and I, it's going to actually be even bigger this year because they're adding well they did vidfest last year so yeah. now they've expanded vidfest and now they're doing a whole what they call audio drama fest it's like mm. audio fest i guess oh, yeah. um, which is focusing on audio drama which is the storytelling aspect and something that i really enjoy too i found a couple of different podcasts that I had been following that were stories. Yeah, I'm taking a picture of us. I can post them on social media. Um, so, in fact, what's the one that I loved? Oh, home, I want to call it Home Alone, but it's not called it. But it was a guy who did this race. Audio drama? No, I'm trying to think of his story. The one that he was doing, I can't think of the name. I'm, I'm going to think of it later and just kick myself. But anyway, he was in this thing called the the, the Mongolian race mm. or the mongrel race okay. or something. And it and it happens across seven continents. And he it's a true story. He documented doing this race with his brother. And it's it was just fascinating. Because first of all, he comes from the NPR storytelling side. Uh, okay. Like he's a real... He's got chops, yeah. And the way that he tells this story is so engaging. It's not called Homeward Bound, but it's something like that. Way home or I don't know. But you know what's funny? I met him. I think I met him at PodFest too, maybe. Mm. But yeah, he did this race across like seven different continents or something. Wow. Talk to me a little bit about what you thought the the experience is going to be like as you started hosting your own show and what you've found as a result of like where you are now after all those episodes and what you've learned along the way. So one of the things I learned is just what you said earlier is sometimes the best parts of the show is what you're doing before you start recording yeah, the show. Yeah, yeah. So I started leaving. I was very in the beginning, like editing a lot of stuff out because I wanted everything to sound really professional. And now I leave a lot more of the fun stuff in where we're laughing or we're talking over each other a little bit or we're making like weird jokes. Mistakes, we used to just yeah. have like really, like really funny conversations. And I'm noticing like when I listen to podcasts, I'm like, you know what? That is actually more interesting to listen to. It sounds but more first, natural though. I yeah. mean, that's what happens in a conversation. Like there's a little bit of cross talk sometimes because you're just like so excited. And, and I love, that's why I do the video. Cause I mean, I used to do these with Skype and now Squadcast makes it so easy, but there's something about the body language. There's something about the emotions and, and even asking people a tough question sometimes, like you can see them like scratch their chin and you're just like oh and the the biggest challenge as a host is i'm just like i shut i have to shut up like i want even if it's like a t i'd rather it be two minutes of silence and i could always edit it but sometimes like the best answers come after those prolonged minutes moments of silence because you can see the guest saying should i give the uh the quick answer or the more in-depth like real answer <laughs> so those are fun moments as well i totally agree in fact i just started adding video to our our podcast for the same reason because uh, Sharon and I did like to talk over each other a lot because you're right like you're not sitting in the same room you don't know when the other person's finished so it can be a little tricky and what ended up happening was that Sharon decided to start take a little bit of a hiatus so I decided to start having guests on and I'm like well I'm just going to record this mm -hmm. in video as well yeah. uh, because that was one of Sharon's stipulations she did not want to be on video so uh, I, which I totally was like fine with uh, but it, I think it's much easier to have our conversation now that I can see the person. Totally. I just knew this was going to be a rabbit hole of like all different topics. <laughs> I'm glad I wasn't disappointed. Do you want to wait? Do you want to know what kind of podcast I'm into right now? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Because we talked about this on my show. I think we got into it. So part of my business I started to expand was really about the aspects of what does it mean for privacy and mm -hmm. security in this day and age? Because, oh, yeah. you know, you turn on the news, all we hear about data breaches, all we hear about is that credit card information being, you know, accessed and things like that. And people sit there and say, like, 
oh, that's horrible, but I'm not really worried about it. My credit card's protected and all. But what my business has really started being a lot focused on is the fact that we do have so much information about ourselves out there that, you know, we're all, we are all potential targets for social engineering now. You know, and we know what social engineering is. Whenever you've gotten those fake phone calls, like, hey, you want a million dollars for Publishers Clearinghouse, or you get the emails that's saying, hey. I just got one, like, literally before this call. It's like, your uh, social security number has been compromised. Please click one, or you will never have use for it again. I was like, what does that even mean? It's like, it doesn't even make sense. And you can tell, like, they're trying to scare people. But it's, yeah, it's very prominent now and I'm sure you're you're deep involved in it and so you probably see some stuff that's even scarier. I am because a lot of the scams now are really, really good. And a lot of them are coming from, they're able to spoof it. So it looks like it's coming from the real company. Like one of the big ones still going on is the Apple ID one that your Apple ID Mm, has been accessed. You have to do this reset. And you know, they're very sophisticated now. So you get these emails and you do, it looks real. And it looks like even the link that you're clicking for savvy as you can be looks real. Uh, Let me tell you, I almost got scammed because I got an email that was addressed to my mom and it was from an insurance company and it looked like her homeowner's insurance. It was, let's just say it was all state or whatever it was saying that you have to pay this bill, click on this link. And what happened was um, I have email set up for my entire family under our family name. So if somebody types in the wrong name, like they misspell it, the catch all is my account. So I'll see that. And when I saw the email, it was addressed to my mom, but they misspelled her name. And so I thought, mm. oh, my mom gave them the wrong email because, you know, we always want to play yeah, our, yeah, yeah. Blame our parents like, oh, <laughs> silly her. Yeah, she wrote yeah. the wrong thing. So I forward it to my mom and she just writes back, ha, 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 very funny. And I'm like, mom, it's your insurance bill. Pay it. Yeah. And she just writes back, it's not me. And so then, of course, now I'm really like of the horrible course. child. I'm like, oh, my mom is so dumb. I can't believe she's not taking this seriously. And I call her up and I'm like, mom, you don't understand. She goes, I don't even, that's not even my insurance company. I don't even know who that is. Wow. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm, I'm the one who thinks I'm tech savvy. And I almost <laughs> fell for it. And my mom was the one who's like, no, we're not even with all, you know, all state or whatever it was. And I was like, oh, but they are really sophisticated. So what I do now with my businesses, and I, I do a lot of security training to make people aware that, you know, these scams are very sophisticated. And because we have so much information out there, it, it could be very easy for someone to find out what maybe your real character. People are always talking totally. about their phone service oh, yeah. all the time. Always on social media of like, I love my phone service. I hate my phone service. Mm. Well, guess what? They get my email address. Next thing I'm getting an email saying, Stephanie, your uh, singular phone service has been compromised. Contact this. And then I'm like, oh my God, singular is my company. But I don't remember that I've just mentioned it 20 times on Instagram. Oh, yeah. And that they make you emotionally react to something so quickly before your logical brain can kick in and say, well, wait, does that make sense? And next thing you know, I'm clicking on a button. I'm paying a $100 bill. And guess what? It's all a scam. So there's a lot of stuff like that that goes on. In fact, I've, I've not only made it part of my business, but I'm part of the education community. I've started taking part in uh, DEF CON's social engineering capture the flag competition that they do every year. Mm-hmm. I just t- took part in that like two years running. Uh, that is, you know, when we actually, we have uh, Fortune 500 companies as our targets and we do our online investigations where it's called Onset, which is open source intelligence gathering. So you go online and everything you you can find out about this company and use as a way to infiltrate them. You write up this whole document and, you know, they're really long and then you submit it and then you get chosen to go on stage at DEF CON in front of 700 people and call this company and try and get what we call flags, which is get them to actually reveal information. So I've taken part in that in two years and it really opened my eyes and I'm like, whoa, this is something more people need to be aware of because it's just getting bigger because we're not going to stop sharing. That's I, I do laugh about the private. So now we the, this all started because I was going to tell you about the podcast that I listened to. I listen to a lot of privacy podcasts now, a lot on privacy, a lot on social engineering, things like that. And you do have people that are all like, people are oversharing online. You need to stop doing this. You need to lock down your profiles. And I have to tell you, I'm a firm believer, cat's out of the bag. Yeah. There is no way that you can sit there and be like, I'm going to erase my digital history. I'm People are never going to know anything about me because the problem is public records are always going to be accessed online. There's just a big story actually in the LA Times about the um, DMV selling information 
That's like that's selling your personal information. <laughs> that's crazy. It's part of their budgetary plan of how they're making money. Wow. It's not just the DMV in LA though. It's all of them. So yeah. with that said, you, you have to understand that your information is out there. We have to be more savvy as individuals to understand and not emotionally react when things are brought to us. So even though it might seem super scary and I don't know what's going on in your life, maybe, maybe you had a death in the family, maybe you're having huge money problems, we all have to sit back and not just take a beat. We have to take a good 15, 20 minutes and say, is this something real? You know, Is this something I want to click on and take action on? And it's really just about getting people to stop emotionally reacting to the stuff. I think that's super important. I think that taking that... 30 second, 10 second, five second, three second pause and just like, is this something that I'm emotionally reacting to? Like when that, that, that I got that phone call, it was like, it was a random number. I didn't recognize it. And it says your IRS is now been compromised and you will lose it. I'm like, first of all, that doesn't make any sense. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> and then when they, anyone, anytime um, someone mentions your social, that's like an immediate trigger, right? You're like, oh, your social security number, like the most secure thing ever. So I think if they, I think personally, like you should ask yourself, like, is this something that, it, that I'm, I'm trying to be scared into something? So, you know, to your point, like, are they trying to li- li- deliberately like push an emotional button? What are some of the, are there any specific podcasts that you recommend that are, you know, may not probably don't get too into the technical weeds, but might help people give them an overview of like what's happening? Yes, actually. In fact, let me look on my phone because I actually yeah. have these bookmarks so I can tell you. So uh, the one that is done by Chris Hagnity, who is huge, uh, he's basically like one of the leaders of the social engineering okay. education force. He has a podcast called The Social Engineer Podcast, mm. which is really, really great. I highly recommend it. Uh, they really go through a lot of stuff that's happening in the news. Uh, they have great speakers on there, people that are all part of the security industry. Uh, so I would highly recommend that. Uh, the next one is called the Privacy and Security and Onsit Show, which is open source intelligence guy. So just remember, privacy, security, and the gentleman that runs that is named Michael Blazell. Uh, he used to work for the FBI, heavily involved in security, and really, you know, they talk about a lot of the stuff that's going on and like how, you know, we not only we need to be aware of just you know letting us know that you know this is happening. What what can we do as a society to change this? Because I really tell people, you know, the two ways that you can instantly trigger people is through fear factors of money or death. Okay, so if you look at it like your IRS thing, they're 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 triggering the money fear there because you hear IRS and everybody stomach clenches, oh, yeah, totally. even if you've never had a problem with mm-hmm. them because you have such a fear built up in your head about oh my god, IRS is never no, IRS is never good news. Nobody's ever like I had a lovely conversation with the IRS today, right? So they use that one, and so it's really anything that's ever brought to you first with money. Or, you know, possible death, you know, because there was that big scam for a long time where people would be um, receiving messages saying, oh, I've been arrested or I need this money because I'm super sick, you know. So they're just two red flags that you have to think about because, like I said, I don't think there's a way of putting the cat back in the bag. You know, I've been a public figure for years. You can search my name right now. And let me tell you, my entire life is there. You know, I used to try and lie about my age on dating sites. Well, that's impossible because <laughs> you just Google my name and it's like, hey, I know yeah, when you were born. Yeah. Well, so, it's, it's interesting because I used to work in um, financial services companies like uh, E-Trade and JP Morgan Chase. And there was this whole thing about data privacy. And I, I Per, they called it personal identifying information, PII or something like that. We have to be really secure about it. But you can take – it was really crazy because you can take like – I think it was like three or four data points about somebody. Ran, and you would think they're, pers- they're definitely random. Like you can take a first name. You can take like a city. And you can take like a, a birth month or something, some, some weird combination. And you can, within like 80, 90% accuracy, like figure out who that person is. So, you know, we think – it's innocuous enough to just let someone know like the last two digits of your birthday, you know, all this little piece of information, but this trail of breadcrumbs, this digital breadcrumbs that we've left all over the internet. Like I, that's why I use multi-factor authentic- authentication as well for logging to devices. And it's a bit of a pain sometimes when you got to like put in a, a second pin or, or get texted a pin. But I mean, nowadays it, when, especially when I see how easy it is to crack these passwords too, like mine, I use a tool called LastPass now. So there's little things you can do, but that's that's us knowing technology. 
they we're in the minority because the people that are not us that did not grow up on technology are just they get overwhelmed when they have to remember their password and that's why all their passwords are like one two three four five exclamation point like asterisk and they think that's secure and it's like so bananas when i hear some of this stuff it's true and even things like you know that two-factor authentication. Listen, it's so easy to spoof a phone number at this point. It's so easy to what we call port. Do you know what phone porting is? Uh, you might want to yeah, educate the listener okay, on Okay, so what porting a phone number is because years ago when, uh, when the law went through that phone companies could not hold on to your phone number, that your phone number was mobile. Like it, you could take it with you. Yeah. What became a thing was called phone porting. So if I want to change to a digital in a, a different carrier, then what they do is called something called porting, where the the phone number then port like points to the different carrier. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's the problem now. It is not hard to have a phone number port it somewhere without that person's knowledge. And it's done in the way that it's always done. It's by getting on the phone, calling the company, and just calling whatever your phone company is, saying, hi, I'm Stephanie, and I'm moving to this new character, and I authorize this porting going on. And yeah, they might ask you some security questions, but again, if your data is on online and people know enough about you, and they're able to guess see what these answers are, or they're able to get a customer service person on there that's not going to be as strict about like having all the answers, you can easily have those numbers ported. And, and this has happened to very high profile people wow. that have been hacked yeah. and had their number ported. And then next thing you know, because your phone, your mobile phone is tied into all of your financials and stuff. Well, next thing you know, I can get into your bank account. I can do all this other oh, stuff. Yeah. And in fact, let me tell you, my recommendation is for people when they are doing online dating is don't ever give out your real mobile number to people that you are just meeting. Make sure you have a, what you, it's called a burner number, but just a secondary number. Or a Google Voice use, or something, right? A Google Voice yeah. something. Because if somebody has your cell phone number, and it used to be really big, like especially when all of the entrepreneurs were coming online, oh, here's my cell phone number, call me. It's like, but now your cell phone is like your social security totally. number. Where it's tied to everything. Yeah, they're sending you text message confirmations. Don't, some, yeah, don't be so giving crazy. out your real phone because you've tied it probably to your mortgage. You've tied it to your bank account. You've tied it to all this personal information. And, you know, you can sit there and say, well, nobody, I'm not really anybody would, anybody would care about. It's not going to be an issue. But trust me, that if there's a way to make money, people are interested in you. Totally. So and my, my, my goal here is by the end of this podcast, everybody runs out and gets a burner number, whether it's Google Voice or whatever. Yeah. And from now on, put yes. that on your business cards, put that totally. online, put that on your dating profile because this – It's so because, easy to set up. It really is. Yeah. So. Well, hold, let's end on that high note of like <laughs> there's something you can do, not that that's like uh, Skynet and it's like, okay, that's it. Never mind. We're done. Like So yeah, just if that's the one takeaway, so – I have a couple of questions I ask uh, as we wrap up to uh, to end on a on a on a higher note. But it, again, we're just doing this to educate you, so please don't be scared and, and do your homework. Um, what's something you've changed your mind about recently? Well, it's funny. I've changed my mind about dog parents. <laughs> okay. My because I I used to be very judgmental about people with their dogs. Hmm. I was always like, if I saw somebody's dog barking or doing something, I'm like, that person just, they just didn't bother to train them. How lazy of them. Mm -hmm. But now that I have a two-year-old dog that I am actively training, I understand training can be a very long and often tedious process. And I have now taken back all my judgment of other people. <laughs> and I, I think it's like when you have a child, That's you true. stop judging of other course. people with kids because you yeah. finally understand Oh, it's much harder to get my child to poop on a toilet oh, yeah. than in your yard. <laughs> so, so my dog, now I understand training my dog. It is a longer process than I originally had given. Very cool. Yeah. Um, what's the most misunderstood thing about you? Misunderstood thing about me? Oh, I, you know what? I can actually answer this easily because I am very outgoing and – I think I come across as a very strong and confident person. People will often say to me, oh, well, you're so strong. You're probably just fine. And I had, I had 
some circumstances in the last couple of years where I felt like I had some, I'll just say I I had some very close deaths happen to me, Mm -hmm. people that were close to me. And I remember talking to a close friend. I said, I think I want to go to a therapist. I think I need to talk to somebody. And he really blew it off. He's like, you're so strong. You don't need to talk to anybody. And I'm like, no, I really feel like I need to talk to somebody. And I feel like sometimes because I feel like I come across as very confident, self-assured that people, when they see people like that, they feel like you've got it all together. Like you don't need to reach out for help. And I feel like in a lot of ways, I'm discounted in that. When I say to people, I need help, people often will say to me, you'll figure it out. You'll be fine. And sometimes like, no, I really need some help. Like I need help. <laughs> like, yeah. So I think that's misunderstood about strong people in general. Like I think we could all use a little help. So if somebody says I need help, don't say you don't need help. Yeah. Don't laugh it off. No. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I saw, I was seeing a therapist last year for um, what I was going through personally. And I think you do need someone, a professional to talk through some of these challenging life situations sometimes. And I think there's no shame in it. There's no stigma attached to it. So I think even if, again, another public service announcement for this episode <laughs> if you if you walk away with two things is like get your burner number and ask for professionals <laughs> if you need them and those are uh uh definitely important things to keep in mind and, and yeah i mean if you say you need help don't let people talk yeah, you out of it because exactly. i mean and I'm, i am glad like the mental health issue has become such a conversation because it was in the past like oh only crazy people go to see that but mm-hmm. no sometimes you just legit need a third party to talk to yeah Totally. And there, there's no shame in that. So yeah, if you'd never say to somebody, you do not need to talk to somebody. Yeah. If they have physically said to you, I need someone to talk to. Yeah. Amen, sister. <laughs> and I got someone to talk to and I am in a much better place. I'm glad to hear that. Well, I'm glad uh, we've been able to connect here and there. And then we finally, I made it onto your show and now I made it onto mine. And now we're best buds and we had a really fun conversation. So thank you so much, Stephanie, for joining me here. Thank you very much, Sue. I'm very glad that we did have all this time together. I'm a little sad that you moved, like you live so far away now, because now I'm all like, totally want to hang out with you. Podfest now. <laughs> so Podfest. I will see you at yeah. Podfest. And I'll let you know, I should be back in the West Coast, uh, hopefully in a couple of months. Uh, we can definitely meet up for a vegan meal. Awesome. <laughs> uh, so where can folks um, track you down and, and connect with you? Oh, just stalk me online. Throw my name into the Google search. That's I didn't know. True. Uh, find me. Find me through my business channels first, because okay. that's listen. And that's the the valuable stuff. Anything else, you're probably just a stalker, and you know. I'm not going to encourage that, Uh, but you can always find me through my website, which is Boom Town Marketing. Boom as in a bang, so Mm -hmm. B-O-O-M, boomtownmarketing.com, and then all of my social links are through there, and and that's a good place to start because uh, if you want to talk any more about marketing or social media or social media security, I am your girl because I am deep in that world now, (laughs) me and and the deaf Connors. We'll definitely make sure we include all those links in um, in the show notes, so thanks again. Have a fantastic day. Thank you. So thanks again to Stephanie for giving us a little bit of scare (laughs) into some of the crazy things that are happening in the online world, but also to remind us of the things we can do to make sure we're protecting ourselves. It was a fun trip down memory lane on all things digital, podcasting, and gaming. So that was always fun. Full show notes at podcastjunkies.com forward slash 206. Don't forget to check out our sponsors, Focusrite, makers of the Scarlet 2i2's amazing sound card, and the podcast Quick Start Workshop. It's going to be November 4th. Head on over to podcastjunkies.com forward slash quick start to sign up and register. Intro and outro music composed by Cedar and Soil. Tune in next week for my second conversation with Andrew Mason, former CEO of Groupon and now CEO and founder of Descript. The company has been doing some amazing things and they've added some new functionality with a recent purchase, which you'll hear all about in next week's episode. Suffice it to say, it's a pretty crazy AI that's going to greatly improve a podcaster's workflow. So that was a great conversation. If you made it this far, no doubt you're listening out for the retention hashtag. Let's go with digital Steph. And that's Steph spelled S-T-E-F. Digital Steph, one word. That's the hashtag. You can tag me at podcast underscore junkies and stephanie at boomtown biz b-o-o-m town b-i-z that's her twitter account thanks for everything you do to support the show and have a fantastic day and week <laughs>